Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to talk to you for the next 20 minutes about the work and aspirations we have at Wagstaffs to help to shape the future of London um, using technology um, to take advantage of the data that we've all been talking about and how we can uh, visualise this, share it and disseminate it um, probably in the best way that we know in terms of our visualisation capacities at the moment. Um, a bit of background um, and sort of thinking about some of the routes that we're taking. Um, in the past 20 years, um, London's population has risen, risen by 2 million. Um, in 2015, it hit 8 million, and that's the most people that have been living in the capital since 1939. In just one day in November 2014, the London Underground carried 4 and 3 quarter million passengers, and every day the bus network deals with 6 and a quarter million passengers. Um, according to the Mayor's 2014 Strategic Housing Assessment, um, London faces what the Mayor himself describes as an epic challenge. Um, this is to double house building and build 42,000 new homes every year um, for the next 20 years. Um, and with 10 tall towers planned for the City of London that will accommodate 50,000 additional jobs, um, we're looking at how the city is getting ready for the impact that this would have. Um, we've not seen building on this scale in London since a brief burst in the 1930s, um, when of course we could build across miles of virgin countryside. But with that no longer an option, and with almost 5,500 people per square kilometre, the capital's growing upwards. Um, we need to look out the window to see the towers that are arriving. Um, first, we had buildings like uh, Centre Point and the NatWest Tower, and then Canary Wharf Cluster, and we heard about Wood Wharf, um, and most recently, um, buildings like the Gherkin Shard, Walkie Talking Cheese Grater, all surging up into the London skyline. Um, we've equally got um, more unusual buildings still arriving, such as uh, Saint 70 St. Mary's Axe, which is actually known as the Can of Ham, um, and uh, 40 Leadenhall Street, which um, is uh, affectionately known or otherwise as, uh, as Gotham City. Um, so this population growth and the uh, resulting effect on properties is placing the planning system under unprecedented strain. Um, new buildings are needed, um, but debate rages over what, where they should be, how big they should be, what they should look like. And making the right decisions has never been easy, but now it's harder than ever. And with the Mayor's Office predicting a population of 11 million by 2050, it's going to get harder still. So the upshot of all this is that the built environment solution of today may be redundant tomorrow. And well, this is not new, and when we have a look through um, uh, London's past, we can see just how hard it is to predict the future when it comes to planning architecture and construction. Um, in the 1960s, a period of striking visionary architecture, um, much of which, though, we may have built differently today if we'd been able to have the tools that we've got at our disposal today to look at it. So taking centre point up on the slide now, and built in the, in, in the mid-60s, at the time it was highly controversial. It was a solitary tower in an otherwise low-rise area, and it has remained so until now. Um, it's currently going through a complete overhaul, um, not least addressing the way the tower meets the ground. Um, uh, London isn't frightened of tall buildings, but ensuring they're sensibly and sensitively located so they look right and fulfil the needs they're designed for is really important. And as a city, we've improved at this, clustering our tall buildings together so that their shapes and heights play off one another in an attractive way in the city, um, in Canary Wharf, and soon in places like Canada Water and Blackfriars. So if in the mid-60s mid we'd been able to clearly see what Centrepoint would look like, and the effect it would have had on its area, we might have ended up with something more like uh, Central St. Giles Building, which is next door, designed by Renzo Piano in 2010, with its kind of walk-through areas, street sculpture, and other elements designed to entice pedestrians. And if you take Cheapside, which was built in 1968 and empty for years, you can see it entirely obscures St. Paul's from the north side. And this is a great example of how the London View management framework could have provided real benefits. Um, if it had existed back then and we'd been able to accurately see the sight lines. I mean, it's all very easy with hindsight, but the fact remains the pressure to visualise the future is growing. And if the technology of today had only existed in the 1960s, some of London's most controversial, controversial buildings, um, I have no doubt, would have been built very differently. And quite simply, London's property professionals have to get it right. The planners, the architects and developers need to find some way of visualising the future so they can understand how any given development will fit into context. And the need to visualise the future and future buildings is not new. Um, it's similar to Tim was talking about this morning. After the Great Fire of London destroyed central London, Sir Christopher Wren drew plans that would do away with the medieval lanes and alleyways of London. 
and replaced them with grand sweeping boulevards enjoyed by continental Europeans. But the landowners, however, had different ideas and were rebuilding their properties before Sir Christopher's plans were able to see the light of day. And so we ended up with a return to the chaotic street patterns that we know today. And the same is still true um, with development reacting to market forces today, racing ahead of planning legislation. There is an argument to suggest that planning should become more fluid and able to react and keep pace. Into the 20th century, and Corbusier again, these were his plans for the Radiant City, or Plan Voisin, which involved clearing whole areas of Paris and replacing it with concrete skyscrapers and highways. I mean, perhaps it was fortunate that he was such an accomplished and prolific architectural draftsman as his brutalist plans were plain for all to see and never went beyond his drawings. And before the advent of computer-generated image, which is on screen again now, the norm was to use watercolours and sketches. It was only in the late sort of 1980s and early 90s when everything started to move towards using computers to generate the image. And as we've seen in all forms of technology, the pace becomes ever faster. And now in the age of big data, we can do so much more than just see how a building will look. And from our experience working with the architects and the planners and the developers, we recognise that visualising an area in 3D and the ability to integrate data is key to unlocking how we tackle development and infrastructure planning in our cities for the future. So put simply, um, what if we, if we create an accurate digital model of London, and we're starting with London, um, uh, it makes sense since we're here, um, we integrate demographic data such as that readily available from the, the London data store um, that we, we heard about this morning to help plan for schools or hospital provision. I mean, if we overlay demographic data onto a 3D map and then overlay that with the school provision that we have and then start to look at properties that are being built, we could start to highlight the areas where perhaps provision isn't enough um, and also see the areas where Brownfield presents the opportunity to, to build. Um, and we also know that um, uh, with Crosswells 1, 2, HS2 and Thames Tideway Tunnel, th that creates a greater picture of our future. We can see and interrogate at a macro level what investment is required and where and when. So take, for example, the London Land Commission, uh, created earlier this year to identify that brownfield land for development in public ownership and help coordinate and accelerate the, the pace of land released for much-needed homes in London. If we could plot all that information on a fully interactive model of our city and then overlay those demographics, will that tell us where these schools, hospitals and houses would be best built? And the pressures on areas around our city are ever increasing as our population grows. Um, since the DLR opened in 1987, I use this as a nice study to, to, to um, substantiate this, the network's been extended several times and passenger numbers have grown significantly rising from 10 million in the early 90s to over 100 million today. And we created a virtual experience of the entire DLR network and surrounding environment. And we modelled all the existing buildings within 50 metres either side of the routes. And we then added all the models of all the consented buildings that would be built within the next 10 years. And the results were staggering. The visual impact is amazing. It was so obvious that the increase in density, when you just look at it on screen, which is basically all the colour buildings, you can see that the pressure that the DLR um, would come under. And we're not saying that we're delivering the answers, but it made itself evident to anybody looking at the visualisation that the previous numbers on an Excel spreadsheet just would never be able to convey. We've done similar pieces of work across all of London, all of which have been focused on visualising a challenge and overlaying multiple data streams and interrogating and using the outputs to plan for the future. Bringing real data into visualisation only really serves to advance our understanding and for instance, at Bond Street Station, we worked with LUL to use Legion data. Now, this is pedestrian modelling to look at capacity issues in the station. Um, we took two scenarios um, and applied them to a fully rendered 3D model of the station. And it made it possible to compare the journey times of a passenger arriving on a train in the station in 2010 versus 2016. The 3D data was hugely compelling and it enabled non-technical stakeholders to clearly see the strain the station would be put under with an increase in the train frequency and passenger numbers. The 3D interactivity offered the ability to look at views you could never see in real life too. You could look top down and through escalators, macro station and micro tunnel views. And we know it was compelling enough because the new exit is currently being built. So anyone passing through Bond Street Station will be pleased to know that the work's nearly complete. And we know people are, are visual creatures, and we're all looking at slides today, and big data is only useful if we can understand it. And we feel that through 3D, 4D, 
5D and now we're talking about 6D and 9D, visualization and advanced digital technology. We're making use of the big data, making the columns of numbers easier to understand and hopefully making big data more accessible. A couple of years ago, we set about how we could visualize all of central London in this way. And to coin a phrase, we set about big visualization to make more sense of big data. And so at the start of this year, we launched View City, which is a joint venture between Vertex Modeling and Wagstaffs. It's the first ever, we believe, fully interactive 3D digital model of central London. At the moment, it covers 80 square kilometers, stretching from Earls Court to Excel and up to Old Street and down to Battersea. I mean, until now, we've relied on physical models and CGIs to help us visualize the future. But this brings together the ability to explore the whole city whilst overlaying data, making our understanding of that raw data, the Excel spreadsheets and graphs that we've been seeing and hear about, so much easier to understand, more fluid and intuitive. And our model not only accurately shows the current built environment, but also helps us to toggle between existing and consented developments. And by embedding real traffic cameras, TFL cameras, and other data that we can uh, glean from APIs and feeds into our model. We're connecting with the city in a way that we've never had before. In terms of planning new buildings, using our city model, we can overlay sight lines. Those are the London visual management frameworks, which are the big yellow and red lines that you could see. Um, transport links, sunlight paths. We have the ability to help council planners understand proposals in context. We've been really thrilled to see the reaction so far in the market to the, the interactive model. Um, the, uh, uh, lots of people are keen to get involved as they're seeing its potential as a tool that can help them understand where we'll be in the future. They can quickly and easily explore options and see them in context. And it's not just about the future, it's, it's nice seeing commonplace and how it works. The similar ideas bringing that type of information directly into the model. So looking now at um, Twitter, for example, I mean, all, all, all tweets are geolocated, so we can overlay trending tweets and hashtags over the View City model so that we can examine trends, even what languages are being used, and showing the makeup of whole communities. Um, the digital learner model is giving us the chance to future-proof our decisions to some extent about the built environment in a way that's not been possible before. We know it doesn't provide all the answers, but we're just hoping that it can help lead and inform the debate. And visualization through technology is the future of planning, enabling developers and infrastructure providers to analyze data and come up with solutions to complex problems. We've now got drones that are capable of laser scanning and mapping our environment. And when we combine this with existing technology, we can create ever more accurate 3D models. Um, we're working currently on the East-West Rail Link, um, which is creation and part resurrection of a train line between Oxford and Cambridge. And we've used drone filming there to accurately visualize the route and how it will interact with its surroundings, the land take, the bridges, stations, and the like. Hugely useful, not only for those behind the delivery of this piece of infrastructure, but crucially something the layperson can understand. We could go so much further though if we think about the major pieces of infrastructure on the cards at the moment with HS2, Crossrail 2, Thames Highway Tunnel. If they were all scanned and implemented in 3D in their entirety at an unprecedented level, with this technology we could take the journey from London to Birmingham in a virtual world. Um, we became involved with Crossrail later on in their design process and we've helped them visualize the platforms and the beautifully curved designs that we'll all be enjoying in 2018, hopefully. Um, but had they been able to do this at the start, um, they wouldn't have had to make a full-scale mock-up, for instance, deep in the Leicestershire countryside. They could have used immersive real-time technology such as Oculus Rift, which is the 3D glasses which put you in an environment, or 3D caves, so that they could have walked through the tunnels and platforms in 3D to, 3D to be able to understand the heights, the roof lines, the sight lines, and the like. So we know that in central London, as much is going on below ground as it is above. And as the towers go up, so the tunnels are bored. And the aforementioned Crossrail and Thames Tideway Tunnel, but also lesser known um, tunnels such as National Grid, who are currently digging two power tunnels that are soon to create a 32 kilometer electric superhighway. Um, meeting increased power and demand is, is great, but also hopefully means that the 14 access points along the route will make for easier maintenance, so the roads don't have to be dug up. And well, there's definitely an argument for using technology to help future-proof our infrastructure plans. And whilst View City may be the macro tool, we can come down to the micro, to individual streets and buildings. The potential for combining technology and data is enormous and hugely cost-effective. And using these tools throughout the development pipeline, it's certainly an exciting time to be working with digital visualization tools. 
but I don't think it should stop with the buildings being built. Sorry, that's the power tunnels. And um, we're working with engineers and facilities managers using augmented reality as well to enable to understand their buildings more intuitively. So this is actually on someone's desktop using an iPad. You can actually see the building in 3D and start to look around it and understand the sort of what's inside the building. And it's, it's helping them look at not just the engineering, but share the engineering that sits within buildings. And the building itself becoming a fundamental part of the facilities management process. Um, so whilst there's lots of technology that's out there that help do this, but if we use the building itself as a content system, we could look at air conditioning, security and fire protection to be part of that content system, easily being able to examine the building and understand what's happening, whether an air conditioning unit has stopped working or which meeting rooms have been used that day or toilets so you can deploy resources effectively. Um, we could even go one better. I mean, if a building were to be made available virtually, it could be used in emergency situations. So I'm thinking things like fire crews with iPads loaded with buildings in geometry in 3D. Um, so that they would know where a fire would be, where people are located, and help evacuate in the best way. And in the, I, I, I do believe that in future this technology can and will be used to help keep us all safe. So this is just really a snapshot of where we are with technology. I mean, there's so much more that can be done and needs to be done. And today we're making decisions about how to house 11 million people, but we need to ensure we use all the tools at our disposal. Our planners and developers have so many issues to consider the scale and massing of a building, its interaction at street level, its impact on protective views, the rights of light of its neighbours and its connectivity. It's a major responsibility for the developers tasked with considering all these issues and then making the right decisions, all of which will lead to the design and creation of beautiful and functional buildings that will last for 30 years and beyond. We, say, we see day in and day out how lack of clarity around the complex future creates intense and long-running debates from the Garden Bridge to the apartments springing up along the South Bank, and of course to the walkie-talkie, which may some, surprise some people, is this year's winner of the Carbuncle Cup. Making a decision and getting it right is difficult, and it's getting harder all the time. I mean, the Gherkin was a forerunner of the realisation that when a building is designed beautifully, it can add to the skyline. It created a trend for interestingly shaped buildings. But should every building be like that? Would it help for us to visualise it all in context? We're already seeing how technology can help us make faster and crucially better decisions on our built environment. And my final point to, to sum up with is they say the future is what you make it. I say the future should be what you visualised, worked out if it's any good, and then made it. Thank you.